Whatu ngaro ngaro te tangata, tui tui te fenua. People come and go, but only the land shall remain. The irony of that fakatoki is that due to soil erosion, we're losing the land even faster than the people. I was asked recently, what would the mountain say if the mountain could speak? I paused for a moment and I thought, what would she say? I think she'd tell us to piss off. I think she would say, I've lived through ice ages. I've had dinosaurs roam across the puku of my whenua. I've seen fires and I've seen floods. And I've seen droughts. And yes, I have seen tsunamis. But I have never, ever in my entire existence seen anything as willfully destructive as you lot, you people. So henceforth be gone, you vile creatures, back to the place from whence you came. But, first of all, pick up your rubbish, your plastic and your pesticides, your rats and your cats, your insects and your weeds, mustelids and possums, and I will once again regenerate the body of my whenua using my plants and insects, lizards and birds, to recreate the vast forests, the forests that once protected my rivers, so that fresh water can again flow to the oceans. The oceans that sustain all of us. The truth is the mountain can talk, and has been talking, but we've been so consumed by the minutiae of our everyday lives that we failed to take notice. That is, until COVID-19 stopped us in our tracks. Then all of a sudden, all around the world, people paused, started to observe the natural environment around them. It was as if, out of clean air, or at least non-polluted air, we could see mountainsides on the horizon. There were stars visible in the sky, and there were birds in our backyards. They could sing. Like they'd just fallen from the sky like mana from heaven, waiting for a pause in the traffic and the pollution to suddenly reappear in our lives. Fact is, they were there the whole time. We had just failed to take notice. 87% of our population live in urban areas, yet they're almost completely disconnected from the natural environment. COVID-19 has shown us and the world that we can change our behavior when we want to, but that generally we choose not to. Doing nothing is no longer acceptable. The environment deserves the same intensive care that we have shown in our response to COVID-19. The status quo is totally unacceptable. As Rose, President Roosevelt said, our generation is on a rendezvous with destiny. It is up to us in this moment in time, both individually and collectively, to make long-term sustainable change for the environment and the economy. And it is the environment before the economy. We can no longer afford to pay lip service to the environment. A far tailed all New Zealand, an isolated island in the southwest Pacific Ocean, with a vibrant, outward looking indigenous culture. If we cannot lead the way, then who else will? Now, you're probably wondering who the heck is this Pani Fero Pākehā to have the temerity? to talk to us about the environment. Well, I'm a farmer, and I live and I breathe in the outside environment day in, day out. Rain, hail, sunshine, flood, drought. I rely upon her to produce the healthy natural food that you take for granted. If I cannot produce food, you don't eat. We need to care for her like our mother and our grandmothers, and nurture her like our daughters and our granddaughters. <laughs> now I'm gonna back it up here and give you an idea of how and why I've turned out to be the way I am. How people arrived here in the early 1840s, 1842, Duchess of Argyll to be precise. That escaped the Highland clearances and ironically, the cholera epidemic. They arrived with very little apart from the family like all early settlers, were entirely dependent upon the kindness, the goodwill, and the protection of iwi Māori. They learned to speak the language and the customs, and formed long and enduring relationships. 
So much so that by the 1850s, the teenagers, the boys, were deemed old enough to be able to travel on horseback over a thousand kilometers right across the island in order to buy cattle for the Auckland market. Now this could have only been achieved with the goodwill, generosity, kindness and protection of iwi Māori. And in fact, we have a saying in our family, nā te mea, nō nā te atawhai, me te manaakitanga o te iwi Māori, ka ora ai i te mea whānau i nai nei. It is only because of the kindness, the goodwill and protection of iwi Māori that the mea whānau is still here today. And we're still farming the same land next to the same whānau that we met those many, many generations ago under the Korowai of Waikato Tainui. The changes that these old people were seeing on the land and its people had a profound effect upon them, even more so after the land wars of the 1860s and the subsequent confiscations. Now, I was extremely privileged growing up around many, many elders, both Māori and Pākehā, and it was from them that I gained knowledge of what life had been like for the many generations before our time. Though I had grown up in an age of using a horse and plough to seeing people landing on the moon, and it was almost as if, as we improved in our technological well-being, our relationship to the land and the environment deteriorated at an almost equivalent rate, became survival in the economy first. The stream at the back of our farm Pre-1860 was like State Highway 1 for, for Tainui Māori. Tens of thousands of tonnes of produce from their flour mills, their flax mills, their orchards and their market gardens would pass through there on the way to supply Auckland and the Sydney markets, even as far as the Californian gold rushes. The elders used to talk to me about the abundance of our forests, our rivers, our lakes and oceans. In fact, they used to catch so much white bait, they would use the surplus as fertilizer for their garden, which I know in today's reality is a complete sacrilege, but that's what the times were. My reality did not reflect this. Now we jump to the present day. Now Aotearoa New Zealand is becoming world famous in terms of irreversible soil erosion. Scientists from Japan, Britain, France, and America are studying the East Cape of New Zealand to tie it off at the. It is estimated that in one catchment alone, 35 million tonnes of silt is being eroded down our rivers and out to sea every year. It's already raised the river by up to 20 metres. That's Kākite Whenua, not even Kākite Ano. There is no Ano. There is no again. Once it is gone, it is gone. Komatu. So what to do? I could see what had happened in my area, and I wasn't willing to wait for another generation to fix the problems of the past. The accumulative effect of what was happening back here in the East Cape was like a massive oil slip coming down our rivers into our oceans. But the difference being is that when there's an oil slick, our nation goes into overdrive to fix it. When the soil erosion in the back blocks, no one apart from the locals who rely upon the land, the river and the sea, no one gives a damn. Here's an analogy you might be able to relate to. Say you've been out on the lawn having a few wines, you go home but you've forgotten to take in the blanket. You come back a couple of days later, you're fully recovered, you pick up the blanket and holy heck, what is this? Everything is dead. All of the plants and all of the organisms that rely upon that have been starved of life. The same thing is happening to our rivers and our oceans. Too much sediment, no light, no plant life, no fish nurseries, no power, crayfish, nothing, just barren rocks. So what to do? Like I said, I could see what had happened in my area, and I was not willing to, or prepared to wait for another generation to fix that problem. I decided to start in my own backyard. <laughs> A once vibrant stream that had been the lifeblood to Tainui Māori was now a stagnant, fetid swamp, choked by willows and invasive plants. I decided to do my own regeneration in my own backyard. Now Gandhi said, four phases to starting a pioneering movement. 
First, they ignore you. It's fine with that. I'm a farmer. I just want to get stuck in and get the job done with no undue attention. Secondly, they laugh at you. By the time they realize that I'm laughing at them, laughing at me, we get to the third phase. That's where they want to fight you. Now, everything in the animal kingdom knows not to provoke or antagonize a brightly colored object. A red-headed farmer in the middle of the swamp with a chainsaw is by no, no means an exception. <laughs> then after that, they want to join you, join you. And that's where you get the ripple effect. By now, it was obvious that a major transformation had taken place. The plants and the weeds that were blocking the river had gone. The river was flowing again. The natural flora and fauna was reviving. People could see that it was no longer pointless, worthless, or impossible. It resonated with them and their way of life and their connection to the river. And they wanted to be part of that community. They could see the benefit for their children's children's children. By me cleaning up my backyard, it had a positive effect on their backyard. Intergenerational, sustainable, environmental change. So in summary, in 2011, I got funding from the Waikato River Authority as part of the Tainui Treaty Settlement Process in order to improve the health and the well-being of the Waikato River. So with a chainsaw and a digger, I started clearing kilometres of the stream, removed thousands of willows that were blocking it, planted tens of thousands of trees, created dozens of white bait spawning ponds, started a, a pest control program on all of the islands of the Waikato River Delta, and finally, building this boardwalk. You might think, what's up with the boardwalk? Why would you build the boardwalk? Well, if you want intergenerational, sustainable environmental change, we have to start with our young people our rangatahi. They need to experience it, to see that river flowing, watch the fish coming in, hear the birds, listen to the rattle of the harakiki and the ropo in the swamp. Then they connect to it. It has meaning and it resonates with them and they gain ownership. And that's how you get intergenerational, sustainable environmental change. But where to? Where to from here? 87% of our population live in urban areas. International studies have shown a direct correlation between our mental and our physical well-being and our connection to nature. Now, Aotearoa New Zealand is also world famous, not just in pest eradication, but also in returning the flora and fauna of endangered species. Hitherto on offshore islands, but now on the mainland. And we want to bring it right back into your backyards. And as chair of the Endangered Species Foundation of Aotearoa New Zealand, I pledge to build upon the success of our rural and our urban communities, not just in eradicating pests, but actually repopulating these landscapes with the rarest of the rare. If we can empower our communities, our iwis, our kura, our schools, to play their role in the restoration of the more than 4,500 endangered species in Aotearoa New Zealand currently, for example, there's estimated to be less than 100 mature kakabik trees left in the wild. Yet most of us can remember them growing in our grandparents' backyards. By empowering our communities and our iwi and our schools to come up with their own projects using a combination of traditional knowledge and modern technology, we can provide hope. We can provide a solution, sorry, in the absence of hope. Our communities nurturing nature. Now, if I can do it in my backyard, okay, it is slightly larger than most people's backyards, you can do it in your backyard. No matter how big or how small, it will make a difference. At a time when the mountain is calling us, it is time for us to heed her call. tangata. <laughs> With your basket and my basket combined, the people and the environment can be sustained. Maori order.
Thank you.